1433, 1492, 1789, 1914, 1945. How did such dates creep into our collective memory? Who decided which ones were memorable? How is an event constructive? Why and for whom? And how does it end up in the history textbooks? The historian Patrick Boucheron looks back at some of these famous dates to see how they help us grasp the broader sweep of world history. After all, there are many different calendars in the world. Not one version of history, but a multitude of intertwined histories. So let's pan out, take a different perspective, and study with Patrick Boucheron the mechanism by which history is made. In 1347, the Great Plague arrived in Europe. The epidemic was to take root for four centuries and annihilate more than a third of the European population. But beyond the well-known Danse Macabre imagery, the plague tells a story of business and transport, that of a world which from Eurasia to the shores of the Mediterranean was already intricately linked. In 1347, the plague landed in Europe. What's more, it landed quite literally because it arrived from Asia by boat. In November 1347, it was in Marseille, and it was to engulf the whole of Europe in 1352. 1353, it was in Moscow. And this illness, which was sowing terror, was to kill a third of the European population, almost half of the urban population. This wasn't the first visit of the plague. In 542, during the reign of the Emperor Justinian I, a first epidemic had struck the Mediterranean basin and Europe. It went its way, reappearing here and there until the 8th century, then vanished. So began a long epidemic truce. When the plague reappeared in 1347, it was an unknown force which over five years, until 1352, caused between 25 and 45 million deaths in Europe. It was referred to as the Great Pestilence or the Great Plague, then later as the Black Death and the Black Plague. It was the most terrible catastrophe which the Middle Ages had known. This might surprise you, but it's a huge and very well-known event about which we can deduce more than we actually know. By which I mean, what tells us about the Black Plague in Europe is the silence which it produces in the archives. All we know of this epidemic comes from the clues it left. A whole series of traces mark the passing of the plague, but without speaking of it clearly. In Orvieto, in July 1348, the community council was troubled by the increasing cost of candles. In Siena, the government was reduced from nine to four members, and building work on the cathedral suddenly stopped. In Toulouse, the price of parchment went up, as did the tariffs for notaries who wrote up wills. In Givry, a Burgundian village with 2,000 inhabitants, the parish priest kept a little notebook where he recorded how much was spent on funerals. The amount soared between June and November 1348. Historians look into the plague as they do with history in general. Wading through a mass of documents, they hunt down the marks left by events in order to reconstruct the facts. And these marks are sometimes extremely tenuous, because the plague is seen above all by the spaces left in the archives. Here, for example, in the departmental archives of the Vaucluse, we find this register of a notary from Apt. The acts continue regularly up until this day in 1348. Then, after a short space, the writing continues with different ink, apparently by a different hand. But the date indicates that this act is for 1350. So there it is, 
Our clue is this space, this blank, this two-year hiatus. The document says nothing about the plague, but since we know that it passed this way, we assume that this was a mark it left in its wake. The register tells us something else as well, perhaps more surprising, which is that after this gap, life continued as though nothing had happened. As an historian, what surprises me most, which for me is an enigma, is why things changed so little. Why the plague, this extraordinary catastrophe, changed so few things in the social structure, in the imagination, in the way of thinking, of reacting, of obeying and of belief. Because today it's difficult to understand how society resisted such chaos. The rare eyewitness accounts of the Great Plague describe apocalyptic scenes. The most beautiful and terrifying of these is probably the Decameron, written by Boccaccio in 1349. It transpired more than once that a single coffin contained both the wife and husband, or two or three brothers, or father with his child, or some other relative. And when a priest thought he had but one body to bury, there would be six or eight, and sometimes more. But images as striking as these are quite rare in the Decameron. Because Boccaccio's Decameron doesn't describe the plague, it describes avoiding it. More precisely, it follows a number of well-born youths from Florence who flee the plague, going to one of their villas to tell stories. Archaeological digs carried out today don't confirm the impression Boccaccio gives of makeshift funerals. On the contrary, they bring to light very diverse tombs, containing one or two victims, but rarely more. It appears that the church attempted to maintain its burial rituals for as long as possible. As soon as a catastrophe of this amplitude came about, people looked to the heavens for a cause. So, the initial search was obviously religious. There was a providential way of thinking. God cannot not see how man is suffering. So, if he brings down such an abominable catastrophe, it must be because of some terrible reproach. What's more, we know from several texts that the first reaction of medieval society faced by the epidemic was to organize processions to drive away demons and expiate sins. Clearly, these processions didn't drive away the plague. And indeed, it quickly became apparent that they tended to favor contagion. Other explanations were therefore sought, this time amongst men. People accused the nobility, lepers, the Jews. Basically, they looked for a scapegoat. It was rumored that Jews didn't die from the plague. This was obviously untrue, but word started to go around. And this led to the idea that if Jews didn't die from the plague, then it was they who had organized it. And how had they organized it? Probably by poisoning the wells, the food, etc. In any case, in many places, Jews were accused of being responsible for the epidemic. A tangible consequence of this was the pogroms. In Baal, Freiburg, Erfurt, Numerous documents show that the Jewish communities were massacred. The pogroms followed the route of the plague and were even sometimes a few weeks ahead of it, set off purely on the strength of rumor. This was the case in Strasbourg, where half of the Jewish community was wiped out on the 14th of February, 1349, before the epidemic had even arrived in the city. Nonetheless, certain people in the Christian and Muslim world try to understand the mechanics of the phenomenon from a scientific point of view. This was the case with doctors like Guy de Chauliac in Avignon and Ibn Khatima in Andalusia, 
astrology was considered a science. So doctors first studied the conjunction of the stars, but also began observing the pulmonary and bubonic symptoms in a strange mixture of rationality and religious belief. In other words, 14th century doctors didn't make do with stargazing. They observed phenomena. They attempted to understand how the illness spread. And they had two models for this. The first was bad air. The illness spread through the air being breathed. The second was contagion. The illness spread through contact. And in a way, they weren't far from the reality which they didn't have the scientific means to fathom. But empirically, they were getting close, eventually understanding that one way of fighting against the plague was to stop the circulation of merchandise and men. Having devastated Europe over five years, the plague regularly returned, almost on a yearly basis, for more than three centuries. Life continued to the rhythm of these reappearances, particularly in the 15th century, where it was particularly deadly. The Black Death became a long-standing phenomenon. It became a permanent blot on the landscape and in the mentalities. It left its mark on tombstones. Look at this funerary sculpture known as a trency, where the figure is shown in all its crudity and pathos gripped by death. Sculpted in 1403, this emaciated corpse, in a state of decomposition to the point of putrefaction, is that of Jean de Lagrange, one of the cardinals of Avignon. It shows the deceased in upsetting cadaveric reality and not in the bliss of an effigy with eyes open towards the promise of immortality. This representation of death, blind and terrifying, appeared in a new genre of image, the danse macabre. Danse macabre simply represents the equality of all in the face of death, nothing more and nothing less. But this was frightening for the Middle Ages, because it was a time when there was social inequality concerning death, which is hard for us to imagine. By which I mean the difference in life expectancy between a farmhand and an aristocrat was enormous. All of a sudden, they saw the grim reaper. The king, the priest, the peasant, the pretty young woman, all were carried away. These infernal rounds where nobles and beggars, the powerful and the humble, were mixed strung out along the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries, accompanying the plague during its entire European presence. Alongside these skeletal drawings appeared another image, that of the plague doctor, who became a familiar figure of the 17th century. Hermetic and entirely waxed, the costume avoided any contact, and the mask, with a hollow beak filled with a mixture of camphor, thyme, cloves, lemon balm and rose petals, was supposed to filter invisible miasma from the air. But the real mechanism of contagion was to remain a mystery for more than 500 years, and when the plague left Europe after a final epidemic in Marseille in 1722, its true cause remained unknown. It took until 1894 and a third great pandemic in Asia, which left 12 million dead, before the enigma started to be resolved. In Hong Kong, a doctor by the name of Alexandre Yersin, continuing the work of Louis Pasteur, finally discovered the plague bacillus, which was to take the name of its discoverer, Yersinia pestis. A few years later, another doctor, Paul-Louis Simon, established that the microbe was carried by a flea, and more precisely, the oriental rat flea. But since no written evidence confirmed the presence of this rodent during the first European plague outbreak under Emperor Justinian I, 
the rat flea hypothesis was set aside for several decades. It was only a century later, with the zooarchaeology work, that is to say, the study of animal bone remains, spearheaded in France by Frédéric Audouin Rousseau, that all the elements of the puzzle finally came together. Little by little, I pieced together the discovery of rat remains in archaeological sites prior to the 11th century. I then superimposed them on a pre-existing analysis of the maximal expansion of the Justinian pandemic. And it matched. The Justinian plague did indeed develop where there were rats. When it came back and swept across Europe for five years, there were rats everywhere. So was this the culprit behind the Black Plague? The Black Rat? Ratus, ratus? No, the cause of the plague was its fleas. It was after all the rats had died that the fleas, starving and contagious, started attacking humans. That still leaves one question. Why the oriental rat flea? Amongst the 2,500 species of flea, the oriental rat flea has a tiny singularity which only shows up beneath the electron microscope. Here, in what is known as the proventriculus, a series of little bristles filter the blood which the flea feeds on. Whereas, with most species, microbes pass through the insect's body along with the blood. With the oriental rat flea, the bacilli accumulate in these bristles, forming a blockage. When the flea later bites a human being, it sucks the healthy blood which gets stuck in the bacillary blockage where it becomes contaminated. The flea can't swallow the blood, so it regurgitates it back into the bite through its mouth like a poisoned syringe. There we have it. The cause of the plague was not in the stars, was not God, nor this or that scapegoat. It wasn't even the rats or their fleas. No, the cause of the spread of the plague were these bristles, a few thousandth of a millimeter in thickness. It was they who, in the middle of the 14th century, from the first areas of infection in Central Asia, allowed the microbe to travel from flea to rat and from rat to man. The story of the spread of the plague is a story of commerce. Today, we're sure of this, and it is more easily comprehensible since the oriental rat flea has been recognized as the vector because the rat flea could take up residence in material, and so it followed the salesman's wares, and rats were obviously in the holds of ships. So the path of the plague precisely follows the lines of international commerce. From the lower valley of the Volga, Russian, Byzantine and Arab sources allow us to follow month by month the progress of the epidemic. From the mouth of the Don and the Crimean ports, the dissemination follows the routes of Genoese ships. Constantinople, Messina, Marseille. Thanks to advances made in funeral archaeology and molecular biology, we can trace the route of the plague. It followed the main Eurasiatic commercial paths by land, river and sea. This is Europe during the plague. Only a few areas were spared where exchanges were less common. Iceland, Scandinavia, parts of the Slavic world. And what was happening around the world during this time? The Maghreb, like the rest of the Mediterranean basin, was decimated. 
India, it is believed today, was more or less spared. For sub-Saharan Africa, we have no data. As for America, it obviously didn't exist for 14th century Europeans. A large part of Asia and the Near East was affected. We know that China was touched, but we don't know to what extent. In any case, one piece of information emerges from the map. The backdrop for the plague epidemic is the area interconnected by the Mongol Empire founded by Genghis Khan in the 13th century. Or rather, what remained of it, with its two principal hereditary branches. On one side, China of the Yuan Dynasty, and on the other, in Central Asia, the Turco-Mongol Empire, founded by the eldest son of Genghis Khan and known as the Golden Horde. After the passing of the plague, the second half of the 14th century was to see the reign of the Golden Horde collapse and the disappearance of the Yuans in favor of the Ming dynasty. In Central Asia, as in China, it's highly likely that the plague broke out. In any case, it was during the period of a political break. What is striking for European historians is that they can paint an apocalyptic picture of the plague. But it didn't fundamentally change anything. It's as if this world, which had been terrorized by the plague, didn't really put itself in question, but set off again. I wouldn't say as if nothing had happened, but nonetheless on the same basis. To understand what gave solidity to this basis, we should probably come here. Here being Avignon, the Christian capital since the popes settled here at the beginning of the 14th century. This was the hub of a powerful and centralized state. The thickness of the walls reflects the solidity of the established power. As of 1348, people died en masse in Avignon because the concentration of people in the Curia favored contagion. Pope Clement VI tried to face up to it. Reading his sermons, you realize that he knew that death could strike at any moment. And yet, work on the expansion of the palace, which he undertook in 1342, didn't slow down. Pontifical bureaucracy continued to run at full steam, be it only to meet the demands flooding in from all over Christendom to fill the ecclesiastic posts left vacant by the death of their holders. Avignon was the real capital of the Christian world, the spiritual capital, but in particular, the administrative and cultural capital. At the court of Clement VI were to be found the major figures of the time, the physician Guy de Chauliac, Petrarch the poet, and Matteo Giovannetti, who painted the frescoes in the chapels of the palace. These images are from a few months before the arrival of the epidemic. With their demons, their scenes of terror and of expiation, they remind us that believers of the 14th century knew they were living on borrowed time in a world where suffering was already a familiar companion. So we can understand how the plague would adopt a figure who was already present. Painted for the first time at the Campo Santo in Pisa during the 1330s, 15 years before the epidemic, the Grim Reaper. When the plague struck, the reaper became the incarnation of death and found its mount over the following centuries. Inspired from the great triumphs by Petrarch, he stands on an ox cart, crushing bodies as it passes. Then, like something out of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, he bestraddles a skeletal horse. These terrifying spectres roam through paintings and illuminations as of the 15th century and impose the ghostly presence of this long-lasting historic event which the plague represents. They have haunted the history of art and our imaginations ever since. And from our contemporary viewpoint, we cannot help but see this triumph of death painted in Palermo in 1445 as a forerunner of Guernica, 
which Picasso painted in 1937 at the time of the Spanish Civil War. Basically, why do we remember the date of the plague? Not just because it happened, not just because it landed in Europe in 1347 and remained there until 1722, but because the deepest mark which it left is the one in our imagination. Today's great catastrophes, the modern plagues, are compared to it. Such and such a catastrophe is to be avoided like the plague. When we say that, our notion of destruction is built around that event. And that's perhaps why the plague is considered an event. Not so much because of the consequences. In the end, it didn't change very much in terms of the organization of power, the social structure, or even imagination or systems of belief. No, it secured a place as the very image of desolation. 